Professor Reddy, uh, we begin at the beginning. Locate us in your childhood. Where are so, you as a I, child? I was born in a little village in India. It's still a small village. <laughs> there are about 500 or 1,000 people now. There used to be 500. And uh, at that time, this was in the 30s, just before the war, and I didn't know about anything about the war, in, even when I was growing up. Um, it was an agricultural community. My father had lands, and uh, we used to kind of um, be there, you know. For the first 10 years, I never left the village. So expectations for you in your life would be as a farmer? No. No. That, uh, that's an interesting part. There were seven children, mm -hmm. four brothers and three sisters. And my father decided unilaterally that the first two of them were going to look after all the properties. And the other two can go do whatever they wanted. <laughs> and you were not in the first two. I was the third. <laughs> you and just it, missed. And it turned out, it's like, you know, when you read about dukes and... Uh, barons in, in England, where if you're a firstborn, you have to be there. Yeah, and if you're a second, then you're sent off to the army or something. Yes, <laughs> that's right. And the third becomes a pastor or a church. Yes, yes, so a vicar. There's yeah, a well-defined order for those things. In my case, it was just, I, I, I was um, the third child, and he said, okay, whatever comes, you, you can we can do. So. You, you weren't restricted in the expectations, but were there hopes for you, or...? Yeah, basically, when they wanted to threaten me with dire you know, possibilities, my father would say, see, unless you study well, you will be like that other guy who is a shepherd going in wow. behind, the she <laughs> wow. behind the sheep. And uh, if that's what you want to do, okay, be my, 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 be my guest. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> I'm not sure it worked, but... <laughs> I was anyway motivated, but uh, you were studious. No, no, I was not studious. You were not. Okay, <laughs> uh, tell I me. was basically. Uh, I didn't want to study. I wanted to have fun. Okay, well, most of us do, and so throughout, you know, uh, until my undergraduate, uh, until I graduated, I would kind of have fun for ten months in a year. And study for one month. And for the exams, pass, maybe. Uh, for the yes. exam, study for one month, pass the exam, well, and then, <laughs> then forget all about it. Before we get you to university, what kind of elementary, secondary education did you have? Yeah, basically, uh, the first five years I was in, uh, first five of, of schooling, I was in the village school. Right. And uh, in those days, this is late third, you know, late, uh, mid 40s. Um, even paper and pencils were not easily available. Wow. Even a slate and uh, things like that. So they, we learned how to re write letters by writing on the sand. Fantastic. And you know, and uh, it's not just me. It turns out there's a whole generation of people in India that learned how to write by writing on the sand. You know. So, <laughs> so, um, and then. Um, I had to leave the village to go to you know, middle Second school year. and uh, high school and so on. Right. So in those kind, of, there there were no hostels, so you kind of stayed as a paying guest, and usually somebody you know, kind of uh, took you in, and then you studied, and you're all by all by yourself. So uh, from the age of ten till now, I've always been away from home. Extraordinary. <laughs> right. And what about? Um Teachers, um, is the level of teaching, once you get to the secondary level, would you say good uh, or the, not so good? The teachers were good. You know, what I mean is they did what they were supposed to do, mm. but they did not turn you on. Basically, they did not kind of try to make a, you know, uh, make you into you know, a geologist or something. Right, say, right, look right. at this rock, you know. No. But uh, that kind of thing happens here in the, you know, in uh, my grandson goes to Brown and out of the blue he came back and said, I've changed my field from biology to geology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> you know, because the teacher was kind of, 
exciting and um, he, you know showed him all the kinds of things. Okay, I'm going to have to get you motivated at some point. Your father says do what you want. The teachers are not pushing you in any direction. Uh, I'm guessing you're an okay student in terms of yeah. results. Maybe yeah, you're not I, I was a good student. You were a good I, student. I was not the top student, right. but I was among the top 10% or top 5% or something. Most people were not necessarily going to university, but you... you yeah, but th th that's what I... My father decided, since I, I'm, I don't have to be there to take care of the property and so on, if I can get into a good college, he would send pay for it. He would support you. And so... Um, and I graduated from school. I graduated in the in the top ranks, uh, and uh, then he said, "Okay, and if you can get into a good school, I'm not going to you know, stop you." And so I en ended up in a place called Loyola College in Madras. Those days, okay, is now called Chennai. Chennai. Um, and Loyola College was, uh, you know, as you might expect. A Jesuit school, right? Very good and probably very, high standards. High standards, but again, rote learning and basically, in India, the learning was not to teach you to think. Mm. It, they teach you to remember mm. facts and figures and things like that. And so, you know, I was okay with it, but. Uh, that you know, you know, these days I tell students, and you know, even when I, what we need to teach people is learning to learn and learning to think and learning to live. None of those are there in the, any curriculum anywhere in the world. You need to teach computers that too. Right. How to learn. That's the way you know. Using computers to learning so, to learn is probably the fundamental skill we need to have. But that didn't happen. Then. What kind of uh, direction did you have a major? You must have. Been no, here, I, I was. I was good in math. math I was okay. good in math and sciences, and so uh, in Loyola College, I, I did a math major. Math, math, what they call an MPC, math, physics, and chemistry major, that kind of automatically kind of moved you in the direction of engineering, rather than medicine. Right. Indeed. And uh, so after I finished Loyola College, I went to. Uh, one of the oldest engineering colleges in the world. Uh, they're, this year they're having the 225th anniversary, and I'm going to be giving a talk right. in July. You're probably one of their great graduates. Uh, yeah, one of the uh, known graduates. I'm yeah. not sure, but I'm a great graduate. Okay, fair enough. But, uh, so um, I, I, I was admitted to that, that school. And uh, there's a very interesting thing I'm, these days I talk about. There's a problem with the way we admit students into Carnegie Mellon or Harvard or anywhere else. Namely, if you're the best in the national uh, rankings, you're admitted by SAT scores or something. But those marks are a function of whether your parents are educated whether you had good school, we went to the top schools, and all kinds of things. If you're a, a child in a, from a ghetto, and your teachers are not that good, even if you're basically pretty good, you don't get in. Right, right. And so we admit the best educated students, not the best students. Yes. Well and said. so there is a book um, called The Tyranny of Meritocracy or something, mm -hmm which kind of makes a point about this. But in general, uh, California system did a great job. They, in 2002, they had, Supreme Court of California said, affirmative action is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So the regents, to their credit, said, okay, then we're not going to use just SAT as a way of admission. We're going to admit people if they're a top student or top 4% in their school. And so if you come from a school in the ghetto, there's going to be a top 4%. Exactly. Right, exactly. So, yes. so that whole idea of what we call geographic equity and gender equity. Right. The other thing is when you get to beyond about 10th class, girls drop out. Many girls drop right, out. Right, right. You know, if you go to any university, there are not that many, you know, as many boys. There are a lot more boys than girls. Right, right. Yeah. And that's worse in India. But here, for example, at CMU this year, because we've been trying to kind of move mm -hmm. in this direction, for the first time, 
the number of girls entering uh, CMU is more than boys. For right. the first time this year. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the philosopher now right. of education. Right. The 20 year old yeah. might not have had this view of life. Right. I, I want to still meet the 20 year old. So, so basically, I want to kind of bring up the consciousness of the 20 year old okay. when they are. No, you're in a, con I want you as a 20 year old. Yeah. Uh, when, so when they are in a position of power, they should say, how can we deal with this problem right. of meritocracy? But based? did you? I, 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 I want yeah. to put you back in your own youth. In my own 20-year-old, yes. I was not even thinking about any of this. Any of this stuff. But it so happened, the admission was based on geographic equity in the ah. engineering college. So, and so I got in. So th Otherwise, there was this principle. I, yeah, there, there was a principle where they said, we have, uh, you know, 200 engineering seats. Yes. We're going to admit them. There are about 20 districts, different populations, and we're going to assign some number of seats for each district. So you got in through geographical advantage. Yeah. <laughs> and geographical advantage in two ways, you know. It turned out I, I come from a location in ge where I am in the corner of two different states. Uh. I, we had lands in both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I wanted to go to Chennai, I could use lands in, in, in that state. If, or other, otherwise, I could go to Andhra Pradesh. So, so I'm, I'm going to be your father now. You're in college. I'm paying for your education. Yeah. You're in engineering school. Uh, now what are you going to do with your life? He didn't ask that. He, he didn't did, ask that. No, I didn't ask either. <laughs> we just said, you know, it is known globally yes that if you went to college and get to you know get the engineering college then you must be a good student and you your life you'll set. get a job you'll get a job you get a job I, when do you catch fire because you do at right. some point when do you and catch that fire? happened in australia ah okay so, get because, us to so australia. i graduated okay immediately uh, there was an internship opportunity in australia for commonwealth students ah. okay so I said, oh, okay, why don't we go there? We had nothing else to do. Right, right. And three of us applied and, got, and, and went to Australia. Where? Uh, we landed in Melbourne. And, um, and so I was an intern. And um, I spent an year as an intern. I was a civil engineer. Yes. Uh, yes. Nothing to do with computers. Trained as in a civil days. engineer, of course. And uh, this was in the 50s. Yes. So I, you know, after one year of internship, I said, what am I going to do? I said, let me join, you know, get a master's degree in Australia or something. So I joined uh, University of New South Wales. Okay. And the first day I was there is when I caught fire. <laughs> Tell <laughs> what, me about that. What happened was the head of the department, my advisor, Stan Hall, said, hey, I'm going to go to the computer center to write a program on the computer. Um, why don't you come? I said, sure. I said, what is a computer? <laughs> and what, is, in, in those days, a computer could mean somebody who computes <laughs> using a machining. <laughs> and so he had just come back from a sabbatical in England where he was using these computers. Uh, it's called English Electric Juice Mark II. Uh, that was a kind of a second generation Turing um, machine. Wow. Turing designed a thing called ACE. ACE, or a, a computing engine or something. And this was Deuce, the n second generation of ACE, okay? And it was, it only had one kilobyte of memory, and that's mem uh, mercury delay line memory. So the main memory was card, punch cards. You did some, read some data in, did some computing, punched it out, and then read it back in and did some more computing. And uh, it's, it, it's exactly, you know, what, uh, uh, the the punch you know the looms you know Jacquard looms used, and you loved it or you liked it or you were intrigued. So basically, he as he was writing the program, he, he kind of uh, thought aloud. I said, "I'm going to do this," and put the you know it was all a matrix operation. I mean, take this matrix and multiply by that. And I was wa observing it, and it didn't take me very long to figure out. I said, "I can do that for you from now onwards. You don't have to come in the evening." So that's I became his programmer, wow. <laughs> and that and uh, so and after a year of and I finished my degree and I said I don't want to be a civil engineer. It looks like I'm doing well here, 
And it turned out in those days, in 59, there were no computer scientists anywhere <laughs> to talk yes, about, yes, or cool. anybody that has even been exposed to computers. So IBM in Australia was looking for someone who had some experience, and I was it. You know, and I got, you know, and uh, I had the, you know, probably the best education of you know, my life at IBM. Tell me about that. So what happens was, IBM had this you know, idea saying, Anybody you are likely to hire will have a liberal arts education from Harvard or someplace. They won't know anything about computers. Therefore, we have to train them from the beginning and then give them, and so it's kind of a, you get a two-week course and then you go practice for a month and then come back for two more weeks and so on. So it's, I, I spent half of my three years in attending classes. It's, it's like, almost like another degree. <laughs> And, uh, but but it, it, this idea of learning by doing, you, you learn how to do something and then immediately apply it. Well, apprenticeship, it's and a kind of apprenticeship. It, it's more than an apprenticeship, in apprenticeship, like bricklaying, yes. you're observing and then do. here you needed to understand the theory. Uh, the two, two weeks was to kind of understand the architecture of the computer and the programming language and all the other things. And you did some toy programs. Then immediately you came and they, they give you saying, okay, go to this customer and do this program. Next stage of catching fire, I would think, would be when you began to have a vision of where this might go. Are you at this point thinking yeah. of the future of the computer at so all? So I, I was, I'm not sure I was thinking about the future of the computer, but I read articles by Newell and Simon who were here from Australia mm -hmm. and Minsky and McCarthy, they were talking about this artificial intelligence. Yes. I said, maybe I should, you know, if I'm going to study, you know, that looks like something I might enjoy, you know. I had no clue what it was. This was in 59, 60. And um, so I was reading papers. Mm -hmm. I was kind of, you know, also doing some postgraduate work with the same teacher that I, because he said, yeah, now that you're almost done, you can probably get a PhD. But I didn't want a PhD in civil engineering. Mm -hmm. So I applied to Stanford and I applied to Carnegie Mellon, only two schools, because that's the way. Well, tell me uh, why Stanford and Carnegie Mellon seemed like the, the good next stage for you. Because that, that's where the AI expertise was. Newell and Simon were here, mm -hmm. McCarthy was there. Okay. <coughs> And um, I was not admitted into CMU. They said, we, you're on a waiting list or something. Stanford admitted me. So I said, I went to Stanford. You must have written some sort of proposal as to what you would like to study there. Yeah. Basically, they had a computer science program in the mathematics department. Okay. I applied to that program. <coughs> it, uh, it was a, a second master's degree. In computer science, and um, I'm not sure if I wrote an essay or anything, but I might have, you know. But my my previous record was all kind of straight A in a, in right. uh, University of New South Wales. So then, based on that record, they said, okay. You were probably better prepared than many people to apply. I said, I also, and besides that, I also have three years of experience working with IBM. With IBM, exactly. So that based on that, I think they admitted me because. In the end, this is a, a big question. You can answer it any way uh, seems right. But it seems to me for people with the kind of competence that you were building, and of course, developed immensely, um, there's a point where you are saying, I'm going to go in the commercial context or I'm going to do an academic direction. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm not sure I ex explicitly thought about it. I could have, um, but after, after I finish my PhD, before we go to the PhD, I need to say that was the birth of so-called computer science. That I was there from 1963. In 65, the Department of Computer Science was formed. You were present at the creation. Yeah, I was present at the creation. Uh, and because I was already well into the PhD, I finished my degree in 66, one year after the department. I was the, one, the first PhD in computer science from Stanford. Wow. Which uh, would make you the first probably, well, not in the world, but close. Yeah, so the... the 
it's one of those theoretical things. <laughs> There were a lot of other PhDs that got their PhD in math department or computer, yes. you know, business school or something. They were computer science PhDs, but they didn't have in their certificate PhD in computer science. Right. Right. They were probably the first batch here and there, you know, and I was one of the first. Again, I keep thinking now no longer of your father but of your mentor now, right. uh, who is I suppose McCarthy. Right. Um, what is he telling you if he is about your future? Well, well tell me what your PhD was on. My PhD, you know, basically, uh, I was taking a course from John McCarthy and on symbolic computation. And he said, hey, by, by the way, we just got a PDP-1 just delivered. It has an A to D converter. If anyone wants things, he might be able to, you know, recognize speech. And I said, sure, I'll go work on it. And I, that's the, that was the beginning. Within a few few months, I had the system working and doing uh, what we call vowel recognition. If you said ah, oh, it said okay. You said ah, oh. mm -hmm. you said e. So, and uh, that's the first time I also got my shock that we we were funded. McCarthy was funded by DARPA at that time. Ah, uh, yes. And um, so. John Ivan Sutherland, another Turing Award winner you might have interviewed already, was one of the DARPA program managers. He comes into Stanford, and McCarthy is saying, hey, here is an exciting thing. This is a young kid. And I was not a young kid. I was already 26 or something. Uh, Raj is doing. And a young he, PhD still. Huh? But a young PhD. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and uh, I was not yet a PhD. I was working. Yeah, out, right? going. So uh, Ivan came and said, said various vowels and he recognized it. And then he whistled into it. And he, he said, you said E. <laughs> so that, that's the first time I realized the speech recognition is going to be very difficult. Ah. Because it, it's not enough to simply know what I said. It's also important to know what I did not say. Yeah, so this is essentially, the, I, I tell this to, as a story to people. If I don't understand the vocabulary, if I, I can take me or you and put it in a Russian classroom, yes. I don't understand the words, I don't have to understand anything, I can simply say, well, I'm going to give you an exam and you failed. I may be the brightest kid, right? but if I don't understand what you're saying, I'm out of luck. And the same thing happens uh, to kids who are second, who are, whose main language is local language. Right. And uh, they're going into this English medium school. In India, when you go to college, everything is English medium. Suddenly, they're thrust into this situation where they have no clue. It happened to me when I went to Loyola College I went from a Telugu medium school and uh, suddenly for six months I couldn't understand a word. I could understand the words, but, but I didn't understand what they were saying. Fortunately, I could read books, textbooks, understand them and do the assignments. I, uh, so I survived. But in general, uh, this is the same situation we find now, but we are just about getting to a situation where AI will help us to solve that problem. We'll come to that later. Yeah. Yes, but let's. You're already launched. Uh, yeah, okay. You've got a PhD in 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 this problem, this right. dilemma of speech. Right. Um, what is the insight you've come to uh, that the PhD delivers? At that point, all that I said was, it would be great if we can build computers that can understand speech. Even that um, anticipation was a new idea, probably. Right. And uh, the interesting thing was, uh, we all thought, you know, maybe we'll solve it in five, ten years. In now 50 years, Still. we are not yet there. Ah. And, uh, you know, we understand lots of things much better. And, um, but, as I said, we are on the verge. Basically, uh, the latest uh, machine learning algorithms, deep learning and so on, are able to recognize 
spoken language in, in, in any language, provided it has been given enough data, like a million hours of speech. Okay. And which we're now capable of having which, machines yeah, know. Not only, and uh, these things could not have been done even 10 years ago. You needed computing power that was like a million or even a billion times more than what I had when I was working on it in the 60s. Ah. So why aren't you discouraged? I mean, no, no. I, I knew that we would be able to do it. Ah. The question was, I said, you know, if you talk to me maybe in 1999 and I, 2000, I said it may not happen in my lifetime, kind of computers recognizing unrehearsed, spontaneous speech from open population. We've already built systems which would recognize my voice or your voice, yeah, yeah. speaker independent. Dictation was already available from Dragon Dictate and Nuance and various other people. but. Unrehearsed, spontaneous speech is very different. I see. People speak, you know. And then on top of that, it's, you know, it's not just one person. It's any accent from any part of the world speaking English. And now take it to Chinese. You know, although there's one Chinese language most of the people speak, there are literally 40 or 100 different dialects. Dialects, of course. And in India, there are 22 official languages and you have to learn all of them. So, Explain to me the aspiration to do this. Why isn't it enough to have interaction with machines? Yeah, that's the fundamental like question. I'm glad you asked. It turns out in the world, three billion people, about 40%, are either illiterate or semi-literate. They can, they can even read some symbols, words, but they don't understand what the sentence means. Yes. And uh, so, right now, that 40% are out of luck. They are not benefiting from our technology. And as I was saying... They live in another world because... They, 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 and they, they are all, of them, all of them are beginning to have smartphones. They can actually, you know, use it to call somebody and talk, uh, but, but they're not benefiting from the whole thing. So what, is, what we're now doing is... Um, uh, not we, you know, uh, large companies, uh, given the large enough data from all these populations, you don't have to know how to read or write to benefit from all the things. For example, if I had a smartphone, I can t say, computer, read me the newspaper today, and it'll show me the uh, pictures mm -hmm. and things, and then I can say, what is the headline, you know, and then it'll read the headline, Say, now skip to the next one. You know, you can kind of essentially read the newspaper. That is, it's what, what we call voice computing. Imagine a world where you don't have a keyboard, you don't have a screen, just like people. When I want something done by Vivian, I say, get me, right. you know, Peter. Right. She even knows the context. It must be Peter back up front because right, I'm right. supposed to talk to him today. She has the background to understand and that. And all that, you know, is there. And so that's what is voice computing. So it turns out Amazon Echo mm -hmm. finally last year came up with a device which is just sits there, does nothing, is completely non-intrusive. Siri was doing the same thing on iPhones, except they're intrusive. I had to press and hold some button. Yes. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So it was, it was possible, finally, you know, it took Amazon to demonstrate it. Now, smart speakers, they're called. Everybody has a smart speaker. Okay, I'm gonna give you credit for some of this development, but I have to get you from your PhD right. to your next stage of intellectual development. So, I, so basically, at that, when I finished the PhD, I had an option, I didn't have any option, I said, I didn't try very hard either. Uh, I went to the department head at Stanford, George Forsyth. I said, George, you know, uh, I'm looking for a job. You, do you think you might be able to use me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turned out there were not many computer science PhDs. He was desperately looking for some. 
So the two of us graduated, he hired both of us, Bill McKeeman and I. Hmm. And we stayed there for three years. You know, Bill left after two years because you know, other places were desperate and he was offered a head of the department job with tenure. What was your so, task huh? in those three years? In those three years after your PhD, what were you working on? Same thing. Same. So basically, I was part of the AI group of McCarthy. Okay. Artificial Intelligence Group. And there were a lot of things we were working on in those days. Essentially everything we're working on today. We were working on robotics, and we were working on language. We were under working on speech. We were working on computer vision. We were working on various other things like music, computer music, music synthesis was done there. So there's a talk by me which online, you'll find it, about early deflections on the early days at Stanford, which kind of explains everything we're doing today, we were doing already in 60s, except now we have million or even a billion times more computing power. That's and the big more, difference. That is that makes a difference. That's it's not, it, we, our ideas are exactly the same as before. You know, they, they, they often say about knowledge in general, at least in the West, yeah. that in the 18th century, an intelligent person could know everything right. broadly. By now, no. So in a way, also you had this advantage in the computer world that early on, you could be involved in a whole range of things. Probably exactly. a young scientist now would not have this option. Right, exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head. Basically, on those days, it was like going and mining for gold in a gold field. Every, any, any rock you pick up is gold, <laughs> okay? Every problem you could think of, and, and you could make serious progress and get a PhD, uh, and that's not no longer the case. No longer, no. So you need to kind of learn all that stuff, right? So in the 60s, uh, we had that advantage, and uh, so people were looking, working on all kinds of things, including synthesizing music, and uh, mm -hmm. there was uh, one person, uh, Ken Colby, the MD, PhD, was working on uh, medical consultation for, you know, like a psychiatrist. Right. Uh, the, he built a program called PARI. So uh, if you wanted to train doctors on how to recognize paranoid patients, and you know, yeah. the, the, the doctors could train themselves using this computer. And no matter what you said, it will kind of uh, uh, give you a paranoid response. Right. Saying, why are you doing X, Y, Z to me? <laughs> right, right. So, I'm, I'm curious, maybe this is not a very important uh, question, about the intellectual climate in the Bay Area in general when you're there. Because Berkeley is also yeah. developing groups of people interested in this. It must have been a very exciting community. Yes, it was. Um, but Berkeley was not yet kind of at the pinnacle, but there was SRI, Stanford okay. Research Institute, and, and Stanford, and Stanford AI Labs was kind of off, off in the hills somewhere because they didn't have space for them. Right. And it was growing, you know. And there was a whole, you know, Hewlett Packard was there and all the Silicon, early seeds of Silicon Valley, Raytheon, and a whole bunch of other uh, companies were there. Why did you leave this intellectual paradise? Um, interesting. I, you know, obviously, um, I was, after three years, it was time for them to decide, you know, what to do with me. <laughs> the department promoted me to associate professor. Yes. So it went to the dean of the school, Dean Royden from math department said, you know, we have, this rule in Stanford where we don't hire our own PhDs. I already made an exception for Raj three years ago. I think he should just go for one year to somewhere else and can come back. Okay. So I, I could have gone to Berkeley, but I wanted to, you know, so um, I came to CMU for one year and stayed here for 50 years. Right, right. So the idea was to go back to Stanford, but you never left. Yeah. Uh, what, what did CMU, what was its emphasis at the time you came? I came because of Newell and Simon. Two of the four founding fathers of artificial intelligence were here. 
And uh, there was also another person, very well-known computer scientist, Alan Perlis. He is a giant in programming languages. He designed many languages. And the three of them together, this was the place to go you know, if, for people that understood. Right. Because most people didn't understand. They would simply apply to some place, like Harvard, to go right. to computer science. There was nobody there until much later when Ivan Sutherland joined Harvard, right? And uh, so it's it's an interesting... What is the year now that you've come to CMU? We, I came here in 1969, 49 okay. years ago, 50 years ago. Right. What uh, What is the stage of AI at this point? Basically, in 1969, uh, we had a... A, a challenge, you know, of what can AI do, and uh, Newell and Simon had built a, a, a six uh, six by six chessboard because there was not enough memory <laughs> to play an eight by eight, and um, and had a chess game working. They had a symbolic computation machine, which could prove theorems. And uh, various other things, I know, and the other thing. And they were beginning to study. For at that point, artificial intelligence meant computers that can demonstrate some kind of a task that would normally be considered intelligent. Like if you played chess. Yes. And if you played, you know, with proof theorems. And in general, pr problem solving was the name that we, they were using. And they worked on it for 10 years human problem solving psychology uh, because they were also psychologists. So they were trying to model human mind, so to speak. Is this related to exp the expert uh, systems? Systems That will come later. That will uh, come later. Uh, yeah. Basically, um, one of the students at, from CMU was Ed Feigenbaum. Yes. Ed went from here to Berkeley and from there came to Stanford, Stanford yes. in 65. I. And he was on my thesis committee. Was he? <laughs> no. Because you we, both got the Turing Award one day together, <laughs> yeah, so this right. is very significant. Yeah, right. And so, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was always kind of uh, uh, new Ed and close, you know, in the sense, but he was working on certain things, even at the, in the Stanford AI lab, around the concept of capturing expertise. Right. He was working with... Um, Biologists and uh, and you know mass spectral experts. And I, so I on. spoke with him. Yes, about right. that. And uh, so I, that was the there. Uh, so he was saying, "How can can I make a computer behave like a PhD?" Ah. Uh. And so that's that's where he spent you know last uh, next twenty years on, made huge progress. And I, I think what you've also, at least to my ears, told us is that. I'm not saying we're stuck at this stage, but we are still trying to get computers not to develop some new ways of doing something, but to replicate human beings. Yeah, basically we were asking the question, not what computers cannot do, so to ask the question, can we demonstrate a computer doing something which when done by a human being would be considered no, you know, intelligent. Right. So that was artificial intelligence. It was just replicating human. You, not even replicating human. That's a bigger word. Uh, okay. Do things that human beings do. Human behavior. Human be problem solving. Problem solving. Uh, at that time, they were mainly worrying about things like puzzles. Uh. And uh, Noel and Simon uh, spent a lot of time looking at how human beings solved puzzles and then try to get the computers to do the same thing. So they've got this young man who's just come from Stanford. Um, where does he fit into this? So basically, I, I, they said, you represent a different part of AI. We're not doing it. This is perceptions. Right. Computers that can see, hear, and speak, and, right. and walk, right, robotics. You know, why don't you come and do that here? So you were the specialist, in a way. Yeah. The, Here. This, is, this is they wanted someone complementary uh, to whatever they were doing, because that would make it, you know, bigger. What did they do to keep you? I mean, you were going to come for one year. Yeah. What happened? 
Now, basically, this was always an empowering environment. Mm -hmm. That is, you wanted to do something, you could do it. There was no rules and regulations mm -hmm. and said, no, you can't do that, you have to sign this paper and that paper. There were rules, but, you know, um, but in general, within computer, in computer science department, things were very you know, empowering. You know, you could do your thing and nobody got in your way. And then I went to you know, Alan Perlis, who was the head of the department, mm -hmm. and I said, Alan, I've been here for six months. You've not even had a single faculty meeting. And he said, what faculty meeting? I don't believe in faculty meetings, he said. I believe in hiring the best people and leaving them alone to do their work, and I will take care of all the administrative stuff. Wow. <laughs> and so so, paradise. You know, the, yeah, because almost any other department, even here, would have faculty meetings. Yes. They had to kind of uh, you know, have a discussion and debate and whether we do this or that or something else. And for me, I didn't want to attend faculty meetings. Yeah. And later on, when I was the dean, I didn't want to attend the president's council meetings. <laughs> and uh, so I went to one meeting and I said, I don't need to go to this. So I appointed, asked my associate dean to attend it. The president was not a happy camper. He said, this is the important meeting. Right. I said, you know, the, his name was, um, um, yeah, and I said, if you have a question you need my opinion on, I'd be happy to do it. But the things you, I, most of the things you talk about President's Council meeting, I have nothing to contribute. Therefore, it's a waste of my time, waste of, so to, this was like a three hour meeting once a so month. So Carnegie Mellon produced an anarchist, clearly. <laughs> no. I know, I'm just uh, no, It could be an anarchist. Uh, but the, the empowering concept comes yes. from the, in the, it's called the reasonable person principle. Okay. Not everything was written down, but if somebody wanted to do something, they could do it, and it would be tolerated, if not you know, encouraged, at least tolerated, as long as it is something a reasonable person would have done. An anarchist is not a reasonable person. <laughs> Fair enough. It, it turns out we had a situation of an anarchist, it was a faculty member in the fine arts department, whose main art was anarchy. He wanted to burn down the computer yes, centers yes, and burn down the building. Aesthetic concept, yes. And and so, and when the promotions came in, I was in the you know I was already the dean at that time. I said, "What the hell? Why are we promoting this guy? Who wants to burn down the computer? What is art in there? You know." <laughs> I, I want to. You're not intellectually lonely at this point because you have this fascinating group with you. Yeah. But in terms of your specialty. Yeah. You are intellectually lonely, I'm no, good at assuming. No, it turned out, fortunately, four or five of my students from Stanford also came with me. Really? Yeah. And then, you know, there was a period in time I, I probably had 15, 20 PhD students at that time. Was this built as a, a sub-department? What was the construction of the so At that time, there were just three full professors and four associate professors. I was one of the four. Okay. And uh, the whole department was like 10 or 12 people, a small department. And then, you know, we would have, admit like 20 students every year. So they'll be there here. So there may be a hundred PhD, only PhD program, no masters, no PhD. It may be romantic of me to put it the following way, but when is your next eureka moment? The eureka moment after that happened when we had DARPA, you know, challenge. So in 1971, uh, Alan Newell chaired a committee on a speech understanding systems report. And that became a blueprint for five years for DARPA. Huh. And say so they funded MIT, Lincoln Labs, SRIs, CMU, and so on, about five different centers all with the goal of building a thousand word vocabulary speech recognition system, connected speech recognition. And uh, we, you know, everybody built it. It turned out in 1976, we had a runoff. And we had two systems, Hearsay and Harpy, and both systems, in fact, in, there are YouTube videos on, about both of them, you can see. Uh, you know, at that time, all the rest of the systems 
did do connected speech recognition, but it would take them an hour to respond. Take mm -hmm. a sentence and take an hour and then respond. But whereas both of these systems, Harpy system was essentially real time, and the hearsay system was took one or two minutes, and both of them, you know, used slightly different. Harpy uh, was using hidden Markov models that was kind of pioneered by Jim Baker, one of my students, who went on to build Dragon systems, mm -hmm. and um, and the other one, uh, the hearsay system, was a, a rule-based, knowledge-based system, like other knowledge-based systems of that year, uh, that ilk in the 70s. And so we decided there are different kinds of knowledge we have to capture, knowledge about sounds, knowledge about words, knowledge about grammar, knowledge about semantics. If I said, pick, you know, pawn to king four, and it would listen to the voice and then make the move, right? Mm. That, uh, that's all semantically correct. That would be, so all these knowledge sources constrain what you look at. If you don't, you know, it, it's like any other puzzle. It could be any sequence, right? Ba, 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 is a, could be right. a sequence. Except it's not correct construction in English. Right. And so, so that kind of, the, the whole purpose of knowledge sources was to constrain the search. Otherwise, it would have been, you know, a million times more complex and taken a million times more. Yes. And then by using this hidden Markov model integrated network, we were able to kind of zoom in and the answer very fast. And, that. and this built your future research. So that was the Eureka moment in 1976. Yes. yes. When we all had demonstrations and everybody demonstrated a connected speech, thousand word vocabulary systems, except the, and the report, it didn't say you have to do it in real time because we, we all understood. But what they did say is, assume there will be computers which are a thousand times more powerful than what you have. Assume that. And, and if you can make it work, you know, no more than a thousand times real time, you, you know, if it's a, a sentence of one second, and you, know, you should be able to recognize it in a thousand seconds. That's wonderful guidance. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, and, uh, and uh, so it was a very, you know, very powerful paradigm because all of us would demonstrate something, we would all be together, and then everybody had to explain what they did to the whole group. So if I did very well, by in two months they could all implement what I did. Right. <laughs> it was a very effective loop on a research progress in some sense. Because we don't have so much time, uh, you've, you've been involved with so many intellectual tasks. Right. Administrative too, we won't talk about the right. administrative, <laughs> right. but the intellectual tasks. So, and I want to get to robotics. Right. Because so basically, besides speech, I had some students who were doing computer vision, face recognition and stuff. Right. We had some students doing uh, robotics type uh, work. And then about 1979, 10 years after I got here, uh, I was in a meeting with the president of the University of Dick Syatt and Alan Noel and so on. They said, why don't we have a robotics institute? Or, mm -hmm. why, don't, why aren't we doing robotics research? I said, we are, it's just that, it's just me and a few students. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a major impact, we need to set up a robotics institute and I need a million dollars from you immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and to their credit, they, they gave me a million dollars and Dick Syatt said, this is not a grant, this is a loan with interest. You have to pay it back to the university. And that's, I, since then I borrowed money for many other acts, including that building there. Mm -hmm. We borrowed five million uh, that we didn't have to finish it up. And then I had to pay it back with interest, the way, you know, from, with, from the overhead. Very motivating. No, I was not motivated. Basically, this is the, this is the only time I, the, I got an interest-free, unsecured loan. Uh, <laughs> what are they going to do? I already had tenure. They can't fire me. Right. So, so you set up a center for robotics. Robotics Institute. Uh, Institute. Uh, and then already we knew lots of things we wanted to do. We, we wanted to do uh, lights out manufacturing, a fully autonomous factory, or at least a cell. 
and we wanted to have autonomous vehicles, autonomous sea vehicles, land vehicles, and air vehicles. I see. And uh, the current cars that drive themselves came out of that idea. The drones came out of that idea. That was nurtured here? Yeah. In fact, we had an autonomous helicopter that was used for Three Mile Island, uh, no, the, uh, not Three Mile Island, when the 9-11 thing happened, yes, of course. we sent the autonomous helicopter to this crash site in Pennsylvania. Oh. And because we, they wanted to know what the hell was going on, nobody could physically go there and see because it, it was smoking. Can you explain briefly to a layman what, the, what needed to be solved to create that uh, uh, autonomous? Right. So basically, first thing you need to understand is all of this comes from the basic idea that computers can do what human beings can do. If a, a human being can drive a car, a computer should be able to drive a car. If a human being can you know, you know, navigate a plane, a computer should be able to do that. Then the question is, what does that mean? Yes. How do you do it? For the first 30 years, we were kind of hoping that we could have knowledge encoded into rules, rule-based systems, knowledge-based systems. That's the thing right. that Feigenbaum championed and expert systems are right. of, that, of that kind. We still use them, except, you know, what has happened is, it's like the telephone system. If you remember the, when the first telephones came, there were human telephone operators yes. that would plug yeah, one the phone to the other, operators. switchboard operator. Right. And, and it was said, if you did not invent an, a switch, a mechanical switch or electromechanical switch and electronic switch, 90% of the population of the world will be switchboard operators connecting the other 10%. <laughs> so the same thing would have happened here. We don't have enough manpower to write all the programs needed or all the knowledge engineering needed to capture the knowledge to make these systems be intelligent. And uh, so very quickly it was clear it took us 20 years to learn that, mm -hmm. uh, that we needed systems that can learn from experience. So the main emphasis these days, in the last 20 years, is systems that can learn from experience. We, we built the first speech system, the Harpy system and so on, learned from experience using the hidden Markov model learning of just the phonemes. But now, is much more sophisticated, much more sophisticated. So the main lesson is we do not have enough people to capture all the knowledge and put it into the computer. The computer has to do it by itself. Uh. So, for example, if to, when you push this to the extreme, I can imagine a day when there would be no programmers. Computers will write their own programs. Mm. They will look over the shoulder of what you're doing or I'm doing and then do the same thing. For example, and we are already working on things like computers that would pay my bills. Yes. I will not, I won't know how to even program it, but what it will do is it will look over my shoulder and see what I do when I go to the bank, uh, online banking and pay the bill. And the next time it says, oh, you're trying to pay that bill, I already paid it. So should I be terrified of that future or Why? exhilarated? Why? You know, all that is doing is saving you some time. Why should you be terrified? So the issue is people then make extension of that automatically saying, this is going to replace me. Not going to happen. The, the concept of a, an AI has never been about human replacement. It's about augmenting human capabilities, enhancing the mental capabilities. Anything you do with your with your brain, with your mind, computers can help you do it better, faster, cheaper. So you can do it 10 times faster. You may be able to do it a million times faster sometimes, like multiplication, things like that. But it, it's all that it's doing is relieving you of that burden. Thank you very much.